There's a question we need to ask ourselves as we approach these end time truths and the question is this. Uh, is the church powerless in these days? Let's look at Daniel 2 and 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away and there was no place found for them. The stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, <clears throat> we know from multiple teachings that this stone that becomes the great mountain and fills the whole earth is the kingdom of God. But I want to look at some things now that prepare us and get us ready to become or to be in, if I could put it that way, that great stone. In looking at this, we need to come to this passage of Scripture. Okay. Psalm 133, verses 1, uh, 1 to 3, actually. Behold how good and how blessed it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descendeth, descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there, in that place of unity, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And so it's important that we grasp what God is getting ready to do in this hour. Not everyone in the church will come to this place. Unity is a choice to align myself with the brethren. Let's look at what unity is not, first of all. Unity is not sameness. Unity produces power. Now, many... Many have thought that unity was everyone believing the same thing, everyone speaking the same thing, and there is a sense of that, but it's not the letter of the word sense. It's the spirit of the word sense, because there is a variety in God, a diversity that maintains unity, and the unity is in the spirit. Uh, Ephesians tells us that uh, in Ephesians 4 and verse 1 it tells us to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace later on it talks about the unity of the faith and we won't be getting into that now but there is a unity of the spirit that the church of God or the body of Christ must come into and it may be the what they express may be different but the unity is a spiritual reality not necessarily a sameness. Unity produces power. It is like the anointing oil. The anointing breaks the yoke. God's opinion of unity on any level. Now listen carefully to this because it's very, very important for us to see. The unity used as the illustration is the unity in building the Tower of Babel. And the Lord came down, this is Genesis 11, 5 and 6, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, now this is God himself speaking, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing shall be restrained from them which they imagine to do. This is the power, actually, of unity under the corrupt leadership of Nimrod. An awesome, awesome line of thought. God said, if the people are one and they have all one language and they begin to do this, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's the awesome power <coughs> of, of corrupt unity, of the heart of man in unity. Now, let's continue to answer this question. What is unity? 
Unity comes through God giving the same revelation and impacting the hearts of men. Remember this, unity, true unity, can only come in God. When Satan fell, he became the author of division. And because he is a liar from the beginning, he can only lie. And lies always, in the long run, produce division. On the day of Pentecost, after 10 days of sifting from 500 to 120, the unity was on the base of belief in Jesus and obedience, not sameness. Now 500 saw him as he ascended into heaven. And all 500 were told to go and tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. But what I call the waiting room of God, the 10 days, 10 being the number of tribulation and testing, after 10 days of set of the test of waiting. Let me underline that in your mind and say it again. The test of waiting, the 500 had been reduced to 120. Hmm. Isn't that an interesting thought? The waiting room of God, the test of waiting, sifts out those who are not wanting all that God has. They may say they do, they may talk that they do, but waiting on God, waiting on God, sifts out those who are not in unity. Remember that in Isaiah, God said, they that wait for me shall never be ashamed. That means that during the waiting period, while you seem to be doing nothing, while it seems God is doing nothing, while it seems there is no true action, while it seems there, God is not performing miracles, God is not... Uh, revealing new revelation, you are just in the waiting room of God. People will begin to heap shame on you. But Jesus, God said, they that wait for me, wait until I show up, that are willing to take the shame of waiting, shall never be ashamed. That's an awesome line of truth that we need to really catch. Now, let's look at the unity that was in Babylon, or was it at the Tower of Babel. It's an awesome, awesome thought, but let's look at it. Number one, they were all of one language. They could all understand one another. Number two, they were also ruled by fear. In, in chapter 10 uh, of Genesis and verse 9, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Literally, it means this, the hunter of men or the murderer or a man of war or one who dominated by force. One language unified them. Fear unified them. God said nothing they wanted to do would be restrained from them. No unity's power although negative. Now let me say this. We have talked to a number of people who have uh, been in, some of them are survivors from satanic ritual abuse. Others are still in and we communicate with them from time to time. This is what they are ruled by. They are ruled by fear. Fear can bring a unity. Didn't say they all thought the same. Didn't say they all did the same, but the unity of fear brought them to a place, one language and fear brought them to a place where God said nothing would be restrained from them, even though they were not operating in godly unity. The reason God broke up the unity, he, or the way he broke up the unity, was by confusing their communication. The enemy has learned from that. And he has endeavored to keep the communication in the body of Christ in confusion. Part of that confusion is emphasizing doctrinal differences. 
And if we had time, we would go into some of that, what that means and, and uh, how that is resolved. But th this morning, that is not our uh, focus. Our focus is uh, what God is doing in these days. Unity in the body of Christ. Unity produces anointing. We saw that in Psalm 133. It is like, Behold our good and our blessed. It is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the anointing oil. And Isaiah tells us that the anointing breaks the yoke. The reason the enemy fights so strongly is the yoke of the world is upon the church in many, many ways. But the anointing coming into unity breaks that yoke. Now, unity is best described by 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and 6, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Slipping down to verse 15 through 18, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body just because it says so? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye or I don't have vision, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No, it is there and it is part of. Remember that the unity of the body is brought together in the mind or in the brain. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, and underline this in your thinking, as it has pleased him. I am put in the place by the Spirit of God, in the place that pleases the Father, not necessarily that pleases God me. I need to remember that. Continuing on uh, in our next uh, session, we're going to look at some diagrams that diagram this for us. But think on these things. If the eye shall say, or if the vision shall say to the hearing, I, I'm not of the body, because I'm not this or I'm not that, it doesn't make it not. God is getting ready to bring the mind of Christ to the body of Christ, bringing unity and proper understanding of function and a willingness to cooperate one with the other through the head. Here's the contact information. Dr. William J. Hurst, 1050 Constitution Park Boulevard, Rock Hill, South Carolina, 29732. If you need to write me by snail mail, uh, then please do. Uh, you can send questions that way, or you can send questions to my email address at drwjhurst at gmail.com. If you desire to see what other uh, resources we have, go to our website, www.drwmjhurst.com. There you will find uh, courses that we have written. You will find CDs, messages, and DVD messages. Uh, and you'll also find a donate button. And if you desire to keep hearing what God is saying to us, we ask that you seek him and ask him how uh, he would have you help us uh, with donations. There is also We are also getting ready to uh, put our college online uh, in full mode. We're still working on it, pulling it together with our wonderful IT gentlemen, uh, but it will be on teachable.com and there will be courses available there that can be taken for uh, credit uh, towards an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical degree. This is Dr. William J. Hurst of Dr. William J. Hurst Ministries teaching all nations the practical word of God and mentoring students 
one student at a time.